that I'm mostly going to be reading from. Um, and this is a roll of tape that I'm just holding on to, and I don't know why. Um, I bought it for Renee because she had to, um, she bought a broom for her partner. Her partner is a ceremonialist. And I said, well, why the broom? And she was like, my witch. And so she needed this tape to package up the broom so she could fly it back to Portland. She's, she's carrying on a broom today. So, um, but for some reason this tape, I just like it, so I'll keep it with me. Anyway, I just wanted to show you the book. You all can look at it afterwards. Um, I have they've been thinking about this for a long time, but I know from working with students, and I apologize to my three students because I'm going to be saying some things that you probably were familiar with, um, that it's very difficult to let go of the preconceptions that we have about what we're making. That we have a lot of ideas about those things and clinging to them in the compositional moment is, I think, ordinary. It makes you an ordinary human being. And it's part of the process of your apprenticeship to let go, to let go of what you think you're doing and to really be in the dream, but also just in the long term to not, to really let go of these ideas that you might have. And that is difficult. And so one of the things I'm kind of doing with this talk is giving you, because I think what happens is that then you're like, okay, well, I'll give myself over to the dream, Jay. I'll do that, and I'll just write, and I'll stay in this dream. But then I get a draft out, and I have no idea what it is. Right, Olivia? I have no idea what it is. So what I'm really talking about is not so much the compositional moment. I'm really talking about what happens when you have a draft. And it's, and it's a tie-in, it's sort of the next step to my talk that I gave in the summer. It's, it's another talk about listening. But in this case, it's really about listening to work. It's really about listening to work. Um, to the work that you have. Um, the talk is pretty uh, rambly, there's sort of notes, and um, I gave you a handout of everything I'm reading aloud by Sarah Bapp. Sometimes I'll mention that, and other times I'm just going to read it straight through, so I might, you might notice that I'm reading Sarah Bapp, and you might notice that I'm not. Um, and I'm going to stop, I think, at one or two points. The reason why I played this Tom Waits is because I, I want us to have that relationship to the work that we have. What is he building in there? The thing that we're making is our strange neighbor that we are just sort of getting signals from. Notes on emergence. Brandon said, write as far into falling asleep as you can. And in response, Joanna said, I believe there are voices that are not mine. Drone, okay, um, so in this book by Sarah Vapp, every page begins and ends with the phrase, drones are probably killing someone right now. So that's what I'm going to, you'll, yeah. Drones are probably killing someone right now. This is Valerie Lucelli. You whisper intuitions and thoughts into the emptiness, longing to hear something back. And sometimes, just sometimes, an echo does indeed return. A real reverberation of something bouncing back with clarity when you finally hit the right pitch and found the right surface. 
Valeria Lucelli. She's a Mexican writer who lives in New York City, and I highly recommend her work. There is a difference between what a writer believes they are making as manifest in plans, sketches, intentions, outlines, fragments written or not in notebooks or on napkins, and what a writer actually makes, what appears on the page. Perhaps I'm speaking about the difference between logos and pathos, between what the mind knows and what unfolds on the page through the imagination. It's difficult to let go of preconceptions we have about what we're making. Such ideas are innocent enough and often originate from our sense of the works of other writers. Works that inspire us, works that come to our eyes fully formed, ready to be realized within our whole bodies. When we approach our nascent, barely formed works as if they have already been made, as if we are not making them, which means we are not dreaming, thinking, weirding, seating, singing across the snowfield page, then we are not listening to it in the context of change, which is to say, we have ceased listening to change. How what we're making changes and how we change through the process of making it. Listening to change is not listening for change. V. Maldonado and I had like a 10 minute conversation about this. The former, listening to change, seems a more active engagement with listening, a kind of listening that holds still. Selfdom recedes as the body receives. That other kind of listening merely skims and filters, brushes past, the ears lined with, proje with projections and selections. That's the kind of distant listening that, I'm, that I want us to move away from. It's, it's filled with our own sense of what we think the world is. Listening to change is much more active. The ears are our ear hearts. This closer, more open kind of listening records moment by moment the one we've never heard before. And the next, and the next. An incremental trace of the work becoming what you cannot fathom. You won't believe what Mr. Stitches saw. Drones are probably killing someone right now. Consider Lucelli's um, quote. I'll read it again. You whisper intuitions and thoughts into the emptiness, longing to hear something back, and sometimes, just sometimes, an echo does indeed return. A real reverberation of something bouncing back with clarity when you finally hit the right pitch and found the right surface. The you, the second person, speaks in order to hear something back, like call and response, like an echo of their own speech returning to their ears with strange textured depth, like us and unlike us. I seek to listen closely to how what I'm making changes. Over the course of many drafts, over the course of a single draft, this list is, I'm gonna stay on this list for a while. From beginning to middle to end, from section to section, within a section, within a paragraph, a phrase, the trajectory 
of meaning accruing through multiple syllables of a single word. So I want to just give you, this is one way that I really listen to the work that I'm making, is I work in smaller increments. It might be a scene, it might be um, an, a dialogue exchange, it might be a paragraph, it could be a sentence. Renee was doing this yesterday with sentences, like your sentence, what emerged at the end of your sentence. Woo. Um, and really paying close attention to what's happening at the very end. Like what is coming through? What is about to take over? And sort of seeing that as a sort of signal or a guide to really core ideas. Core ideas of the work that you don't quite know. You shouldn't know. I mean, you may know thematically, I'm writing about X, I'm writing about you know, my divorce, I'm writing about my child, my son, those are things that I've been writing about. But really, like, what's underneath that? So I'm gonna read that again. I seek to listen clo closely to how what I'm making changes. Over the course of many drafts of a single draft, from beginning to middle to end, from section to section, within a section, within a paragraph, a phrase, the trajectory of meaning accruing through multiple syllables of a single word. I listen closely with the hope that I might, that what I hear might help me guide the work over the course of revision towards the work's full realization. The work's full realization, not what I what I think it is, but what the work is becoming. Guide, the word guide seems like an operative metaphor. A person who guides steers only at crucial moments and otherwise witnesses others making their way. Head over here now. Bathrooms to the, to the right and to the left. Your choice. A designer makes a mark or a tab, they call this a guide, that catches the eye in order to provide a quick reference, a map, stop sign, go. Guiding creates a flexible structure that holds space for discovery, alteration, chance. What's driving this change motion is what Flannery O'Connor referred to as the mystery of personality. With access points in specificity, ambiguity cultivated by human contradiction and paradox, the razzle-dazzle between idiosyncrasy and connectivity. The best guide knows they're being guided. If we do not let go of our preconceptions, our minds fix things into place. They harden, inhibit our capacities for revelation and adaptability. The thing we are making, what it actually is, is not what we think. Mary Rufel, you simply cannot learn, bless you, doesn't I? Um, Mary Ruffel says in one of her lectures from Madness, Rack, and Honey, you simply cannot learn and know at the same time. And this is a frustration all artists must bear. The revision process, in my experience, braids together intuitive and intentional modes. That is, we're working through our nerves, but we also have a sort of guide that, you know, a couple things that also might be helping us into that dream. We don't want to let go of what Frank O'Hara in Personism, a manifesto referred to as, paraphrasing here, working through one's nerves. And we understand that something beyond our nerves needs to guide us as we attempt to revise, to see again, to see anew. Listening to change is more than just thinking about the aboutness of your work. It's re-embodiment. It's like finally meeting yourself. 
It's tuning into what the work is, what it needs in the moment, this moment that is different than what it needed in previous moments. When I listen to change, I pinpoint, I hold together, I rub together, I juxtapose character, speaker, persona, personalities, vocal qualities, atmospheric gestures, plots and subplots, motifs, image chains, errant images, various thematic threads continue and frayed. I look for byproducts. What is taking over here? What's he building in there? I put my faith in the thing that's taking over. The best way I might guide you on how to listen to change in your work is just this concept of emergence. Drones are probably killing someone right now. This independent clause appears in small type at the top and bottom on every page of Sarah Vapp's devotions and effulgences. It seems really eerie right now, that phrase. Each time this sentence appears, I read it. I do not skim over it. As I move further into the book, I begin to speak the words aloud. Drones are probably killing someone right now. And it comes to feel like an incantation, a secret you tell yourself about your secret selves. It comes to feel like a ghost, if you define a ghost as something emergent, as, as something both invisible and present, beyond one's perceptual field, but felt in our loins and our elbows and the tips of our ears. All the things headed our way. Here are more beautiful words. I just added that, actually. Here are more words along with blank space within and around the words from this beautiful book by Vap. So now I'm going to the passage on your handout. Drones are probably killing someone right now. Across the years since we bought the cabin, I have arranged and rearranged this book into many formats. And sometimes this has been a book of lyric poetry. Sometimes this book has been a list of questions. Sometimes a collection of deeply disrus disrupted aphorisms. Sometimes lyric essays. Sometimes it joined with other research and writing while I completed coursework and two dissertations for my PhD. Sometimes I deleted everything and started over with lists and bullet points, then pasted everything back in again so that I could slam my head against it for a few more years. Sometimes the materials gathered for this book have been a thousand pages long, the scattered writings of all those mornings gathered together. And once I deleted and deleted until the words barely gasped themselves out onto each page, a pool of white around them. Pieces of this book have been pulled out of emails, then deleted from the book again. I've used portions of letters, journals, and checked my memory against the news sites on the internet. As the world changes, the book has to change. As my children have been born and have changed, the book has to change. As my brains have dissolved into the brains of the family animal, into the whale, into the forest, into the fungal mat, this book has to change. Sometimes I try to write down these morning desperations, these morning weather reports from inside our deepest tenderness is. I want to write from within our deepest kindness, we. I am writing forth from the entrails of our family animal. I want to extend our tentacles toward whatever are the origins of the naval and industrial pinging 
deep in those waters all around us in order to destroy them. I am amazed when the babies speak words I've never heard before but long to understand. Drones are probably killing someone right now. Just wanted to add a content descriptor. In a later passage, she uses um, a pretty crude word for um, female genitalia. I left the word on the handout, but I'm not going to say the word. I just wanted to give, give you all a heads up. That book is about living and loving in the face of so much violence, so much death and possible death, originating from our own destructive, selfish behaviors. That book is about living with death, dying a little every day. As the book's epigraph states, oh, this is tiny. That's Clarice Lysbector. That's a picture I took. Death takes place in my very being. How can I explain to you? Clarice Lysbector. Zapp's book is also about transformation from young woman to woman who procreate, procreates, miscarries, raises a family, from feelings of emergence and gain to feelings of disorientation, frustration, and grief over the loss of the quiet, capacious selves. All the possibility, the expansion of multiple selves within and beyond youth, all of it disintegrates you raise a family into being, drones are probably killing someone right now, and something else emerges, a kind of second body, a phrase the writer Daisy Hilliard in her book Second Body, which I highly recommend, uses to describe the various empathetic selves in touch with the world beyond one's perceptual field. So it's sort of empathy for things that we can't see, that we have no direct contact with. Drones, okay, I'm going to uh, move back into a passage here. Drones are probably killing someone right now. Glut, I, the noise in this cabin, my brain's exploding from noise.